Welcome back. You're watching Stock Watch with me, Julieta Televi, and joining me to take your stock related questions this evening are David Shapiro from Sassman Securities and Wayne McCurry from FNB Wealth and Investments. If you'd like to send questions, please do email stockwatch at bbtv.co.za or via SMS on 41392. Uh, David, Wayne, good evening to you both. Nice to see you there. Wayne, I'll start with you tonight. Uh, inflation in the US is a problem. Uh, it came in at 3.5% CPI, um, at the expectation was of, what, 3.2%, and everyone seems to be losing their minds. Um, can I ask a question that's come through from a viewer? He says, or she says, sorry, so US markets are down again because inflation increased. Um, this is because the market expected it to be lower, but what if the market accepts that the current inflation is the new norm, and then surely equities will start trading at higher but normal levels, or am I missing something? Look, first of all, the inflation number that came out was uh, 3.5 versus estimation of 3.4. And I think it's the third month now that it's missed by 0.1%. So, I mean, this is not, I mean, it's on the wrong side, make no mistake. It's staying higher than expected as well, but it's not earth shatteringly different. You know, it's not 1% yeah, versus, yeah. it's not 4. Point, it's not 4.4 versus an estimation of 3.4. Yeah. So we must just see that in perspective, but clearly now the market thinks that interest rate cuts are further out now. Just, just as point of interest, beginning of the year after the Federal Reserve statement in December, there was an 80% chance of a rate cut in March. Now there's a 20% chance of a rate cut in June. So it just shows you how the expectations have moved out. But to come to the actual question, if this is the new norm for inflation, Share market's not going up, eh? If 4.5% is the new norm for the U.S. Treasury 10-year bond, stock market's not going up. Why? Because it's just that much uh, less risky putting your money into a, a government correct. bond. Okay. The stock market is The stock market is discounting cuts in interest rates, which I think are coming. So I don't think 4.5% is the new norm. Maybe it's 35 on the bond. And inflation, the new norm is not three and a half. It's probably maybe two, two and a half. It's not zero like it used to be. Yeah. But yes, so inflation is coming down. It's exactly the same as what you spoke about last time when the last inflation number came out. A large increase of that, uh, the large, the, a large proportion of the month on month increase is their so called, what's it, uh, shelter component which essentially turns out to be the long bond because it's your mortgage bond interest rate that you pay. Now, you're measuring year on year from 3.5 to 4.5%. In three months' time, that 3.5 base becomes 4.3. Yeah. So in three yeah. months' time, a major compo component of the month-on-month -month increases is actually going to come out of the system. But the market knows this and is anticipating it. So that's also another reason why I don't think this 34 3.5, 3.6% is the new norm. Yeah. I mean, David, you're actually in the States. So you can tell us how much mm. more your bagel costs, although I don't know if it's to do with US inflation or the RAND, um, uh, you know, uh, depreciation against the dollar. Partly, um, you know, it, 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 it is a concern. There is certainly a belief that prices have gone up and uh, way higher than wages have gone up. So there is a little bit of discontent about inflation but to be honest you know just sharing what wayne said as well when we look at the inflation numbers this is not food or oil or those things that normally push the inflation price up this has been medical care or uh, uh, motor vehicle insurance you know which are kind of once offs but i think the one thing that is happening is that we're getting it wrong or the the forecasts are getting it wrong so inflation carries on but the forecasts uh, the models haven't quite got uh, or quite uh, built in, um, you know, what's been happening in, 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 in prices. So I think that's where the market's adjusting. So we're now down to two rate uh, cuts this year yep. from the four that uh, Wayne was talking about, and it might not be any. So I think we've got to get used to it. And, and, and that's important. Just start adjusting your heads for maybe uh, a situation where rates aren't going to come down and look for the businesses that can survive and do okay in an environment like that. I, I mean, is, is, you know, that was my next question. Are there obvious businesses mm. that do better out of a higher inflation environment? 
or the obvious candidates? Well, from my point, you know, this is, comes back to tech, you know, who are unperturbed by what's happening, the amount of money that's being spent on AI by businesses transforming and continues. So those seem to be the defensive stocks in a situation yeah. like this, rather than the pharmaceuticals and, you know, those old, uh, those old defensive kind of stocks that we used to go utilities, whatever it was that one would buy for yield and that. So your defensive stocks, and this would be the growth stocks where there's not going to be any kind of, uh, um, you know, where, where inflation remains at these levels, even though you've got that premium, you know, the worry of the discounting, discounting at, um, at a higher rate, you know, gives a lower present value. But I think most of that is already in the market. Mm. Okay. Um just a, a one last question. Sorry, and I don't want to belabor this point because there are questions coming through. But do either of you have in your mind what the average inflation rate in the U.S. was over the last 50 years or the average long bond yield? The I mean, long how, bond yield is about just over, the long bond yield is just over 3% and the average inflation rate is about 25 Okay. Okay, so actually, essentially, you're not that far off. Right, um, one of the things that is going to be happening tomorrow is the separation or the IPO of We Buy Cars. Uh, we spoke about it last night on the show, but there's a question that's asked. Um, uh, sorry, uh, if I can pull this up correctly. Um, my experience of IPOs shows that they lose value soon after listing, even by close of day. So what is the panel's opinion on buying We Buy Cars shares on their debut? Wayne, what do you think? Look, it's always difficult to make generalizations that all shares lose value after their IPO. Some do, some don't. So you can't make a generalized, a generalized statement that companies lose money after the IPO or after the hype of the first day. The second thing is don't ever take what happens on the first day as indicative of the valuation of the share. You've got to let it settle a little bit first and get some volume through, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, um, and if you want a recent example of that, you just want to think of Truth Social, Donald Trump's share, um, that a company that was listed, if um, that surely gives a, an indication of um, reality away from valuation. Uh, David? Um, just the, the one point is that there has been an unbundling or a dividend in specie or how, whatever the correct legal term is or however it was done. That means if you had transaction capital, you're getting these technically for free you haven't got a price so you might find that uh people who receive the shares decide okay i'm getting out or i'm going to take a, a profit mm, okay. so you might have some very weak holders in the in the in the uh, transaction shareholder share capital as uh, um shareholders you know they they they've got no base price yes there's a base price that will be given to them but I don't think um, they're going to be the same as someone who subscribes for a share <laughs> and then finds a share price falling or so on or gets them for, you know, for, for whatever other reason. So it, who knows? I, I don't know. Mm. I, I um, Listen, there's a lot of hoo-ha around it. We haven't had a new listing. So when it does come on, it attracts a lot of attention. Uh, but it's very hard to, to, to reckon where it is. With the, listen, listen, if interest rates remain at these kind of levels, and it's a, one of the consequences of, of rates not going down in the U.S. That does have consequences here because I don't think our governor is going to be quick to reduce rates. You yeah. know, he's made it, he's, he's made that quite clear. I think he's looking to the U.S. before he does anything here. So whether he kind of breaks away and decides to, it's time to start reducing rates, we could be stuck with these very high rates, which does make put a lot of pressure on consumers. Mm. Um, I think continues it continues to put yeah. pressure on. I mean, I think it's um, FNB actually, Wayne, because I saw Simon Brown tweeting that um, they're seeing transaction capital shares at three rand seventy and about six rand uh, eleven cents for we buy cars. That's how they kind of see the split happening tomorrow. Well, it'll be a bit, it's always interesting to have a new listing, especially something you know that's involved with uh, everything we know that's gone wrong at transaction capital. Yes. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what the shares actually do trade at. Right. Uh, then the question on City Lodge. Uh, what does the panel think of City Lodge hotels? They seem to be well managed, well positioned for increasing tourism uh, and travel and cheap. I'd appreciate your thoughts. Wayne, sticking with you. Well, I like this. I like, I like it. Um, I like the whole industry. It's the one industry. It's the one sector of South Africa 
that's really firing on all cylinders. Domestically, we're not going overseas because it's too expensive. So we're touring locally and foreigners are loving it here, even though it's mainly the Western Cape. Foreigners are loving it here because they come and get a great experience for Nikki's just about. Mm. Has been a bit frustrating, mm -hmm. though. I mean, um, I have to say, as as one who picked this for David's uh, share challenge, um, <laughs> it hasn't it hasn't done what I thought it would do. Uh, it, it, it's been yeah. a bit of a soft performer. Well, the easy money's been made. You know, the money from when I say the easy money from when it was sold down to nothing uh, during yeah. the pandemic to where it is now. So now it's it's got to be operational. You know, you're back to occupation rates, what, 55, 60, 65. So they've now got to start working on that and working their efficiencies in. As you said, uh, you know, they've paid down their debt. Most of the money is uh, a lot of debt is down. And so they're well positioned. It's now up to uh, benefiting from the tourism that Wayne's talking about and more people traveling internally. They were always business travels. I don't know whether that's taken, you know, that continues now because it was a Monday to Friday uh, that you really had the city lodges uh, occupied. They weren't there for, tour, you know, for the weekend tourists or for the, um, although, although, of course, they do get a fair sprinkling of that. So now they've got to, you know, it's the economy that's got to help them on now. So that's where your frustrations come in. <laughs> yes, yes. And and they don't gamble. You know, you haven't got the you haven't got the uh, benefit of slot machines and others that that some of the other hotel groups have got. Yeah. Well, I suppose at least it means that you can actually pay your hotel bill at the end of your stay. Yeah. Whereas uh, if you've, you've gone got to some city, machines, if you want a Coca Cola or something or a sandwich, you know, you can put a five rand piece in, something comes out. But you haven't got the other slots. Yeah. To be honest, David, if you put a five round piece in a vending machine, nothing is coming out. <laughs> not much, not much comes out. I don't know what, what non inflationary <laughs> planet you're living on. No, Shapiro sometimes he's, he's thinking back to the, to the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> Four and fifty coke. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm. uh, yeah, that was a long time ago. Uh, a question has come through on discovery clicks and Diskim. We also discussed discovery last night, um, and both analysts were quite bearish on on discovery. And actually, we were having a look at the charts, and over five years, you really you've lost money on discovery because you certainly haven't made it back by a dividend. So you're you're definitively down. Um, when, if I may start with you, do you think there's a a change of foot, or do you think discovery is going to limp along for the foreseeable future? Look, first of all, when you look at discovery, obviously the share price hasn't done much for a long time now. Um, I mean, it's 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 actually down on a five-year story, and that's not too dissimilar to the other life companies, excluding Momentum. The life companies have not done that well over a sustained time period. But coming back to discovery, I. I think the bank is holding the share price down. I really think the bank is, and the capital they've put into the bank, it may well be very successful over time. And, and time will tell, obviously. But the bank and the capital into the bank has, I think, hurt the share price, has pulled the share price down. Secondly, just generally, the life insurance market and the banking market in South Africa is overtraded, eh? There's stiff competition here from very, very well-established players. So maybe Discovery can make a difference because they've probably got a larger overseas component than most of the other life assurers and uh, et cetera. But yeah, I, I, I can't see the share price leaping forward from this level. I mean, I don't know whether it will fall much more because it is actually at very low levels and previously when I mean, it gets to the sort of 100 rand level, it tends to bounce back up again. Yeah. But I, I can't see it shooting the lights out in the shorter term. Um, David, longer term, is the catalyst what it is trying to build overseas with Vitality? Um... How many years have they been at it? You know, and we haven't seen any real results coming through. Uh, you know, it, it's just, I don't want to say it's not working, but it's at a pedestrian pace. So when you go through the numbers, it's still health, insure, uh, life, and the UK businesses that are contributing most of the operating profit. 
Um, but I mean, take that away. There, there's very little contribution from all those overseas operations in which they've spent an enormous amount of time and financing from here. You know, I don't think those are standalone yet, or if so, they break even. So remember, when I say here, uh, I'm talking about uh, you using rands to pay off, uh, to invest in dollars. So I think it, it's, it's straining. And, and again, on the local market, uh, as, as Wayne said, in an environment, in an economy that's growing less than 1%, you can't grow those kind of businesses. Mm. And the interest rates are high. People are not going to take out the life policies. You know, even medical aid, they start to consider, well, you know, um, the lower what should option. we have? Should we go comprehensive? Should we? Uh, they start to look at the lower options. Yeah. So it's not an environment that is really helping them. It doesn't mean they're not a good operation. They're not doing well or they're letting people down. It's just the environment in which they operate. Mm. Now, I'd be very cautious. Mm. You know, just, just you don't have to buy them, you know. Yeah. You can wait. You can wait till circumstances change. Would you be similarly cautious on clicks and Discim? And interestingly, Discim is increasingly moving into medical insurance. You know, and and which and you sort of wonder if they're going to start encroaching on on you know some of the established players. Um, Wayne, do do you like either of those? They have been traditionally very expensive, and so you know, have traded at very high multiples. You know, look, uh, Discam, we're not so keen on Discam at these prices. And clicks, you know, in the shorter term, it has a fantastic run, but it is looking a little bit expensive at, at these current levels. But uh, whether going into medical insurance and that for Discam will actually pay off, I mean, who actually knows? But one thing Discam has got is a very, very loyal customer base. I, I don't quite understand it because every time I go to Discam, I see a lot of very happy old people there, <laughs> and, they, and they honestly look happy. And I, I know I'm old, but I don't look happy when I go in there. But other people look happy. They seem to enjoy going to Discam and buying their lotions and <laughs> potions. And... Oh, Wayne, I promise you, you can have more conversations walking through the aisles at Discam than you can at any other social occasion. You know, you see everybody there coming to fill their prescriptions, buying whatever they need. So it is an area, you know, and it's normally in a shopping center where there's a nice place to buy toasted cheese and tea and that. So just give us a... <laughs> uh, well, I wouldn't have said, you yeah, the, the, the toasted cheese you sandwich just gave me... Don't ever be in a hurry if you go to just yeah, no. Don't ever be in a hurry. Uh, no. But I suspect you know? what Discam, I mean, obviously they want to foster a friendly environment, but they want people to buy things, not just have a chat. <laughs> so are they successful at <laughs> doing that? But those are the happy people Wayne's talking about. But look, they're both good operations. The problem is that in the last three or four years, you made no money. You know, those share prices have tracked nowhere, which again is uh, fundamental to the circumstances in South Africa. There's no real growth there. But they're good operations and they're clawing up. You know, they're clawing their way up again, uh, using or uh, building market share from perhaps some of the smaller chemists and some of the smaller operations. And yeah. that. But they're solid operations. But um, there's, you know, you, you, at at the moment you're not going to make a lot of money out of it. You know, just circumstances won't allow. But operation operationally they're good. Shells are always stocked. Prices are always attractive. Yeah. Well, Lipstick actually... fact is also part of the. You know, they beauty. Yeah, they yeah, sell absolutely. beauty product where there's always a demand, particularly whatever you know whatever the uh, economy is. Yeah, and uh, interestingly enough, Discam's actually had a pretty good year so far. Um, moving on to, I, I suppose, stocks uh, intrinsically linked to the stock market, and that's Quilta and 91. And 91 actually had a really great day today. It was up about 5%. Um, mm -hmm. The viewer says, what do you think is the better long-term investment, Quilta or 91? Wayne, if you had to pick, which which would you go for? Unquestionably 91. Mm. Why? Why? Yeah. So, why so? Um, why are you so definitive in your this answer? This is this is a truly well-established, well-run asset management company that has proven itself over decades that they know what they're doing. Quilter's a, 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 a redistributor. It's a, they collect money. They're not per se an asset management company. They they're a sales organisation essentially. 
Coulter, interestingly enough, has had a very good year and, and it has vastly outperformed uh, its former parent, Old Mutual, since it was uh, unbundled from Old Mutual. Um, do you think maybe that's it's, it's had its fun on the market, David? I, yeah, I think the operations were slightly better than anybody expected. They're UK based or I'm not quite sure anymore, but um, um, I've got no real grasp or understanding of Quilter. You know, it operates in a market that we're not sure of. You know, we understand uh, 91, we understand Old Mutual Metropolitan. They, yeah, they're, they're basically South African companies. You know, we meet their agents, we, we meet the people that work for them. But I don't know Quilter that well. Okay. You know, I, I, I don't know that operation, yeah. Is there any particular reason why 91 had a rally like it did today? Especially in the light of markets that we expect to be constrained um, <clears throat> because of higher inflation numbers and, and the likelihood of fewer interest rate cuts. The RAND was down 1.5%, you know, just on, on the basis. It was 1840 overnight. It's 19, what's it, 1875. That might have been a, an underpin. Um, I think that all, we're also expecting rates to go down in, in, in the UK and in Europe. I don't think there's any particular reason. You know, if you look at the chart of 91, I think it's in the same price range that it was, you know, uh, three, four years ago. Mm. So I don't think there's there's anything that you could read into it. I wouldn't get yeah, it. Also, in 91, you're getting at almost an 8% dividend yield, mm. and Colt is about a 5% dividend yield. So 91 in the face of it mm. looks a lot cheaper. Yeah. Okay. And here's a bold question. Um, I have 2 million rand to enter a single stock with a view to a 12 month hold. Nice pass or which banking stock? Okay, so now we don't know the circumstances of this person's portfolio. So maybe it could be that they have a 20 million rand portfolio, so this is just a tenth, or they have 2 million rand in its entirety. Um, I'm weighing the diversification <laughs> being the only free lunch. I don't know how you're going to answer this question. Yeah. Look, if the choices are only banking shares or NASPAFs, I'd actually go for a banking share, maybe go for Standard Bank. I mean, remember, it's very difficult for me to recommend my own company. Um, go for Standard Bank. These banking shares, I think, have been unjustifiably punished in the, in the very, very short term. Uh, Standard Bank's earnings were fantastic. I know there's base effects. I get all of that. But uh, still, these share prices, I mean, Standard Bank, I'm just looking at, is down from 210 to 180, just below 180. And you're getting a dividend yield of also almost 8% on this. 8% dividend yield in these banks is, is quite cheap territory. So I would rather buy a bank than NASPERS. Mm. David? No, he's underpinned by an 8% yield. I mean, <laughs> We don't know where NASPES is going. I must say, one of my, you know, I'll, I'll let you know my stock pick now. Yeah. But it's based on 10 stocks that Bloomberg have released, you know, for quarter two, most of whom I've never heard before. But one of the stocks that they do pick is Tencent, you know, on the strength oh. of not on their online business, but rather on their, uh, what they call these short videos and also on AI inspired advertising. You know, they feel that the profits are going to go back to the mid teens. So they're quite positive on um, on, on ten cents. So you, you might have a turnaround in China. People are starting to look at it again, you know, from the stimulus point of view. But yeah. I don't know. It's it's, or, or split it's, it's it. such a one million call. to each. Yeah. One million to Standard Bank. One million I, I, I to Nasdaq. I would go with Wayne. I, at least I'm at least I'm underpinning an eight percent return. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I'll which get. I, which, yeah. which I'm not sure you're going to get on Nasdaq. So. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, let me get to your stock picks. Maybe this is a, another um, uh, poss a possible contender for this person's cash. Wayne, what is yours tonight? Man, I'm going for a company that most people probably wouldn't ever have heard of, uh, Soundhound. It's what? an AI company. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it does voice recognition software. And, you know, for you're talking to your car and your car talking to you and call centers and where they interact with humans. I mean, imagine that actually interacting with humans and they have, they have this voice technology. Now they've shown spectacular growth in revenue. I mean, they're still not making money. They're still losing money, but estimates are that they'll break even over the next two years. They have restructured. They were spending too much money. They've cut back on a lot of their expenses, but right now there's a short seller report out on SoundHound. So the shares being pummeled. Yeah, it's well off its highs. It's down 8% today, so maybe wait a while. 
because the, 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 the short yeah. sellers, we all know they're either very right or extremely wrong. Um, and certainly don't put all of your money into it. I mean, the, the short sellers say this thing's worth absolutely zero, but that's what, that's what short yeah. sellers do. Um, but yeah, sound on. I, I, I think okay. maybe wait a while, and as I said, don't put all of your money into it, but I think the share is being unjustifiably punished by this short sellers report. Well, I was watching Dumb Money last night on Netflix, which is fabulous, on the whole GameStop phenomenon. Um, David, what's your stock pick? I'm going for another AI stock, well, it's uh, Salesforce, which is actually a Dow 30 company as well. Simply going to benefit, I think, looking for very, very good results in the second half of this year, year um, again, on AI spend, which I think we have underestimated. I don't think we understand. Even Jamie Dimon, in his uh, letter out you know, earlier this week from uh, JP Morgan, mentioned that this is like the steam engine. You know, AI is just ch going to change everything that we do in business. And um, so Salesforce is, is a company that helps you. Um, you know, it, it's a software business that helps you with AI, introduce it into your businesses and so on. It's not a, it, it's, as I say, it's a Dow 30 company, but I just like it. It's kind of been ignored. Uh, just catching up a bit now, so very yeah. solid business. But okay. Soundhound, I'm looking for, I'm looking all over for pieces of paper to to, to read up on Soundhound. Yeah, <laughs> because... I think we're all going to do a bit of research tonight. <laughs> um, David Wayne, thanks very much for joining us as always. No, no, no. David Shapiro is from Sassan Securities. Wayne McCurry is from F&B Wealth and Investments. And up next, the close. Stay with us. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.